My name is uh, Terry Pardee, and uh, I came to Haynes in the early spring of 1970. Uh, I had just returned from Vietnam, and my father, Charlie Pardee, now deceased, had uh, moved up here actually while I was in the Army. And when I, I got home, uh, I always wanted to see Alaska, and my dad was up here, so I headed north to Alaska. And the day I saw this town, I knew this was probably going to be where I was going to be. And, then, and 40 years later, I'm still here. Matter of fact, my time in, in Haines will, will be 40 years in April yeah, when I first came. Wow, I understand that you did a lot of different things while you are here. What did it take to stay in Haines? Well, when I first got here, in, in that time of the year, there was still, I don't know, a couple of feet of snow on the ground. And uh, there, there were two sawmills operating. And uh, there were uh, logging crews actively working in, in the woods and, and supplying logs for those two mills. The economy was good, but really one of the first jobs I had was uh, Marty Tang's at the Pioneer Bar hired me as a bartender. And uh, that was pretty interesting. It was a lot of fun for a young single guy just out of the Army. I mean, you know, free food, free beer, what more could you ask, you know? Met a lot of girls, you know, so, and that's uh, that's pretty much it. But uh, also, too, there were construction jobs and things like that. And over the years, uh, I did that, and I, I fished commercially in the summer, and uh, more construction in the fall. Then went back to college for uh, a couple of years for the you know the fall and winter quarter, and then back in the spring before fishing started. And, I kind of did that for uh, a couple of years until uh, I met my wife, Barbara, who's a teacher here. Her name was Armstrong at the time, pretty little red-haired school teacher. And uh, we've been married, uh, it was 37 years in, uh, in December, and raised our three daughters here. And it's been, been a great life. I would, wouldn't trade it for anything. I always said if I found a place I liked better, I'd move there. But and I've been all over Alaska. and. Seen probably two thirds of the world, but I wouldn't live any place but here. It's a great place. Were there ever any struggles living here? Well, sometimes you, you know, when you work seasonally, uh, there's uh, there's breaks in your income from time to time, and uh, that can be a little challenging. Uh, I, I went from just fishing the summers to building a a bigger boat in the uh, mid '70s. And built a 47-foot sun-fjord fiberglass boat, and it was great for crabbing and long lining. And so I extended my season. I got into the herring fishery and fish dungeness, uh, king crab and tanner crab, and so those things all kind of dovetailed together. And then on the prices on the shrimp and crabs and stuff, has it changed over the few years? Well, it, it has gone up somewhat from where it was when I first started fishing tanner crab. I was getting. 16, 18 cents a pound for them. And then one year the, the king crab became real uh, scarce up in the Bering Sea. They'd overfished them. And so they didn't have enough king crab to meet the, the international market. And so a, a, a cheaper alternative was tanner crab, but it inflated the price of tanner crab to a dollar a pound. Well, Man, I thought, I'm going to get rich on this deal. Well, what happened then was every sane boat in southeast Alaska got a hundred crab pots and went tanner crab fishing and just beat the heck out of the tanner crab. I mean, before that, there was, there was all of a sudden there's like 80 boats in it, and before that there was like 20 of us in all of southeast Alaska fishing tanner crab. So that was one downside there. While they were doing it, they were, with those hundred pots, they were allowed to retain king crab. Well, it didn't take long to knock the king crab down to nothing and forced a, a closure on king crab that lasted almost 10 years before they built up enough to be able to be fished again. And they've knocked them back down a couple times since then. And I don't know when they're going to reopen the king crab fishery, but every, everything has a cycle and uh, it's, it's all about price and, and uh, if a fisherman can uh, make money on a product, you know, they'll be there to get them. You know, now everything's limited entry, so it's kind of a, a moot point 
and uh, I, I jumped into every fishery I, I could at the time. There, there was no limited entry restrictions or anything like that. Now, uh, young people like you, to get into any of these fisheries, you have to buy a permit from somebody else, and I, I think that's too bad. In your fishing career, were there any like big fishing stories, like the big fisherman stories, when you come home to and tell everybody around the bar or something? Well, uh, I, I love fishing, still, and I still participate in the uh, Dungeness crab fishery. But starting in the early spring, there's still snow on the ground, and I'd I'd go down south of Ketchikan near the uh, near Dixon entrance and the Foggy Bay and Boca de Quadra area, and there was a there was a large mass of herring that came in there to spawn every year, and the Japanese. Had a, had a market for the herring roll. That's what you'd, you'd catch the fish at a certain stage of, of the roll development within the fish, and then the fish would go into the tenders, and the, the uh, tenders would deliver them to processors to strip the roll. And it was a, a very lucrative fishery, and I, I just had a 26 foot aluminum skiff, and I'd rigged up a, a drum on it so I could retrieve my, my nets with. Uh, gasoline hydraulic power and uh, I made $26,000 in 24 hours down there one time. Wow. Pretty good money. I, these other guys from Petersburg and other places, they, they made more money, but I mean some of those guys had like $90,000 in their herring skiffs. I got by on the cheap, so that worked out pretty well. But uh, yeah, I've had, had big fish catches and caught big prices, caught big halibut and you know, done all that stuff. And when I was fishing tanner crab in the winter, when everybody else was that fished up here were weren't really doing anything because they were only in the gillnet fishery. Uh, I, I was making oh six to ten thousand dollars a week fishing tanner crab all winter long. And I and my my partner Coy Taylor worked together on that and had a lot of fun, a lot of experiences. I up our boat coming back from Juneau one time and a big northerly and had to duck in behind uh, Point St. Mary and uh, we had to beat ice for almost two hours before we could even drop the anchor. It was a drag. I was glad to get through that. But, uh, oh yeah, there's, there's a million stories. I used to see things every day that most people only read about or dreamed about whales everywhere. And I saw a killer whale jump out of the water one time and snatch a duck right out of the water. I was watching this duck fly along the water, and all of a sudden there's a big splash directly into the duck, and this killer whale came up and just snatched him out of the water. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I never would have believed it. Amazing stuff like that. After my brother uh, died in an airplane crash here in 1981, I, I kind of stepped back for a year, and uh, it was really a hard thing to, to lose him. He and I were very close. He was three years younger than I. and. Uh, so I decided to get out of fishing, and uh, it took several years to do that, to sell everything, and uh, I was trying to decide, well, okay, what am I going to do now? And so, for some reason, I had the, uh, the idea that, well, this town needs really a family restaurant where kids can come with their families and parents and everything and uh, have birthday parties and stuff like that. So we worked a deal with... Uh, Clinkett and Haida, who owned at the time the Chisel Building downtown, and we renovated the downstairs and turned it into a restaurant called Porcupine Pete's, which was pizza, ice cream, and sandwiches. And it was a lot of fun for a while, but we we ran it for about 12 years, which was about 11 and a half years longer than I really wanted to. <laughs> so, well. <clears throat> I entered college in September of 1965, right after, you know, the fall after I graduated from high school. And uh, I'd been a, a collegiate or a high school gymnast and uh, was ranked well at the state level. And my high school coach was going back to his college over at Eastern Washington State College, now Eastern Washington University at Cheney, and he asked the seniors on, on the gymnastics team if we'd like to go to school over at Cheney and, and help him restart the gymnastics program over there. So uh, 
after the, the state meet, I had a chance to uh, see from the inside what a college looked like and uh, the lifestyle of the students on campus. And by competing at the state meet over at uh, Washington State University at Pullman, and I thought, well, that's when I decided I wanted to go on to college. And so this was a good opportunity to do it. There was no scholarships involved or anything. The, the school didn't have the money to do that at the time. It only had 6,500 students uh, in the whole school, and most of them commuted daily from Spokane. It was kind of a suitcase college. On Friday night, you could hear the suitcases slamming, and everybody was going home to Spokane. So uh, I, I started there, and the Vietnam War was just getting started then. And all entering freshmen and sophomores were required to take uh, two semesters of ROTC. And so you had to take a semester as a freshman and a semester as a sophomore. And then you had the opportunity to declare it as a uh, major minor type thing, military science, and you could be uh, graduated as a second lieutenant at the end of that four year period. And I looked at that program and I thought, well, that's a pretty good deal. And so I, uh, I took the ROTC route. But by my second year, I'd, I'd run out of money and the, the draft, I knew as soon as I, I left school to earn more money to go back, I'd be drafted. And so I just enlisted in the Army in uh, January of 1967. Took my basic training at Fort Lewis, Washington, and then went to uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia for advanced infantry training. And I'd uh, applied for uh, paratroop jump school. And then while I was at uh, Fort Gordon going through advanced infantry training, I took the, uh, the test for special forces and passed it. There were only three of us out of a bunch of guys, but most of them were too young. There, there were a lot of uh, kids that never finished high school, and Special Forces wasn't taking those guys. So <clears throat> as soon as I finished jump school, I got orders for Fort Bragg, North Carolina, for Special Forces training, and spent the next year and a half there going through Special Forces training. Some of the toughest training and some of the best I ever had in the Army. But it was rough. So did you ever see the front lines in Vietnam? Right after I finished Special Forces training, I uh, was sent to the 3rd Special Forces Group just across the street from where I'd been training for a year and a half. And they were going to put me in headquarters company, a 3rd Special Forces Group, and officers' records. They were going to put me in an administrative slot. After everything I'd gone through, that was... The sergeant major says, you know, you can stay here the whole rest of your military tour. You know? And I thought, you know, sergeant major, I didn't go through all this just to sit in an office. So one day when the sergeant major was out of the office, just across the hall, there was an administrative clerk named Ike Eisenagel. I'll never forget him. And I said, Ike, get me on a, a levy for Vietnam. And he looked at me like I was crazy. He says, yep, you want to go to Vietnam? Are you nuts? I said, just call Mrs. A, make the call, get me on the levy. So about 20 minutes later, he called across the uh, the hallway to me. He says, R.D., you're in. It's your funeral. <laughs> you know, that was it. And uh, the sergeant major came back, and a day or two later, the, the, the fact that I had been put on a levy for Vietnam came across his desk, and he was not happy because... Uh, he, he didn't authorize the release, but he couldn't stop it by that time I was on my way. So I cleared post, came home for uh, a 30-day leave, uh, reported to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington for overseas deployment. Went to Vietnam and uh, was sent to a, a, a special forces unit called MACB SOG. It stood for Studies and Observations Group. Well, that was a reconnaissance unit. And most of our uh, our operations were across the Laotian and Cambodian border. And the overall project was run by the CIA. The day I got to Da Nang, which was the headquarters for Command and Control North, MACB SOG, uh, the sun was going down, a beautiful place, right on the beach. Just uh, 
south of Da Nang. And there was an area there called Marble Mountain, and there were these three big marble mountains that just jutted up out of the sand right on the beach there. And uh, because they were, they were high points, we had uh, security units on, on the high ground all around us to protect us from overwatch from the enemy. Walk back to the billets and crash for the night, waiting for my next assignment. And, uh, and I just got there that day. And at 2.30 in the morning, the barracks right next to mine blew up and killed five guys on that end of the barracks. And then all the shooting started, and I'd been issued a rifle that I, that I had with me from Natrang. It wasn't an M16, but it was a, a 30 caliber carbine. And uh, it was better than nothing, but not much. And so I made my way to the perimeter, and just as I was going out the door to the billets that I was in, a captain barged out the door ahead of me and engaged an enemy soldier right under my window that was placed in a satchel charge, getting ready to blow up that end of my billets. And we had just gotten out of there, and he got shot in the foot, but he got the sapper. And then uh, there was another one just across the way from him that he engaged and uh, killed him. So I just made a beeline for the, uh, the perimeter. And uh, in the meantime, I passed a mortar pit, and uh, they were firing illumination rounds in the, into the air. And they came down in a parachute and lit everything up. They had millions of candle power in these flares. There were hundreds of them in the air trying to light everything up. And these guys had infiltrated the camp. They came through the front gate all day long and then hid under a, a mess hall that was uh, where, where the, uh, our indigenous forces, special forces worked with a lot of foreign troops. And some of them you couldn't trust. And, uh, so as soon as it got late enough at night, they come out from underneath this mess hall, about 200 of them, and they started blowing everything up, killing our guys. And it was a battle, a fight that lasted all night long. And it was the night that Special Forces lost more Americans, more Green Berets that night than any single battle in the entire Vietnam War, including Long Bay, uh, that went up against the tanks just a month earlier. And uh, so I'm on the perimeter and I, I jumped in a, a sandbag hole. They were all prepared positions. And it's all full of Vietnamese and, and Chinese nuns, mercenaries, that fought for us. But they were all wounded. And so I'm given first aid as best I can. And uh, I, uh, I had a rifle that uh, my, uh, my uh, 30 caliber carbine uh, wasn't, wasn't feeding properly. And so I couldn't trust it. So I grabbed an M16 from one of these wounded guys. And then they start jabbering in, in Vietnamese and Chinese, and I couldn't understand what they were saying. Finally, one of them said, VC, VC, you shoot, you shoot. Uh, what's this guy talking about? And uh, so I looked about 50 yards away, coming towards our position, uh, were, were two uh, Asian Vietnamese types. They had kind of bushy hair and everything, and they were in shorts, but they had no shirts on. And one was helping the other one because he was wounded. And one had a weapon. And I said, VC, VC, you shoot. Well, I couldn't really identify the end. I hadn't been there long enough. You know, I'm not going to just start shooting people just to shoot them. And finally, they got close enough that in, in the light, I, I saw their faces real clearly. And then the, the one with the weapon looked me right right in the eye. And at that moment, then he started to raise his, his, his weapon. And I saw that unmistakable silhouette of the M16, and I knew what I was dealing with. And so I opened up on him and uh, killed him. And uh, that, was, that was the first battle. I mean, I just, just got... And so that was quite something. But they'd done enough damage to our compound that... Uh, we weren't operational for about a month. Uh, they blew up helicopters, blew up our ammo dump, they blew up everything. It was a well-coordinated attack, but there weren't very many of them that got out, out of the camp. They, they came in there to 
fight and make it as expensive as I could, and we killed her. So and that was just the first one, and I thought, man. I asked an older NCO, I says, uh, is it like this around here all the time? He says, no, sometimes it's worse. What was the hardest experience when you were in the war? Oh, Turns out. losing my friends. We had a, a helicopter come in and we, we knew that some of the guys on it were wounded and the helicopter was badly damaged and uh, the pilot did the best he could to keep it in the air but it, it piled up on the end of the, the runway as he was coming in and uh, it cartwheeled half a dozen times and burned and uh, those guys were all lost. And we had to go out and get them. We tried. We recovered them, thought maybe somebody might be alive, but they weren't. And that, that was just one time that I, I lost more friends on that one than uh, any other single event. You know. And we lost, it, it wasn't uncommon to lose, lose guys, it's just the way it was. But we, we lost fewer men for the size of our unit than most infantry units did because we were better trained. We were, not that we were just better people, we just had better training. And it, it saves lives. What, what was the worst injury you had during this time? I, you know, uh, I was never, uh, I never received a, uh, an injury or a wound that uh, required hospitalization, but your, your health gets so degraded because of the bad water. And I had uh, typhus, which is a waterborne uh, illness, raging fever, and I had uh, malaria twice, two different types of malaria. There was, uh, in, in that particular area, there was uh, falciparin and uh, Vivax malaria. Yeah. And I had both those. It takes about 10 days uh, to get past that, and then you're weak as a kitten for a couple weeks afterwards. It just totally saps you. But for third world populations, it's fatal in a lot of cases. I don't think many Americans died of it, but uh, certainly the, the rural Asian population just you know, killed the, the babies more than anything else. Three to five years old, they just wiped them out. But uh, when I got out of the Army and came to Alaska, I was out, out of the Army for about seven years. And then I, I had a meeting with uh, a National Guard captain who'd been in Vietnam the same time I was there. And he talked me into coming into the Alaska Army National Guard. And uh, I, I enjoyed it. I, I was in the, the Guard for almost 29 years and retired here in 19, uh, or 2005 with just not quite 34 years active duty in reserve time. And uh, it was great. I've, I've been all over Alaska. I've seen tons of Alaska through the, through the Guard. And uh, my last duty was as a battalion sergeant major of the 3rd Battalion trying to get that battalion ready for uh, deployment to Iraq and Afghanistan. But by that time, I was so close to age 60, and I'd already been extended past the 30-year mandatory retirement time. But uh, the general came down and made a special trip just to tell me that I wasn't going to get to go. So, yeah. It was a bitter pill. I, I thought I had one more war left in me. My wife, of course, was ecstatic. So I didn't have to go. <laughs> she, she tried to hide her glee. <laughs> I don't know how well she did it. But. But it, it was fine. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, I think for uh, meeting the people, and, and that's what the military is all about, is the quality of the people you have in it. Now, it used to be pretty much a, 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 an all-masculine program, but 15% of the force now are, are women, and they're excellent. You know, they're, uh, they offer terrific service, and they're, they're fighting and dying although they're not supposed to be attached to combat units, the, the enemy in Afghanistan and, and Iraq are, are hitting trucks and soft targets, and a lot of those trucks and soft targets are driven by women. They're getting killed just like the men are. And uh, I, I think people forget that. And 
I think the most important thing is to treat our, our people in, in uniform with uh, great respect and uh, appreciation for what they do. And uh, they're, they're just wonderful people. And uh, my generation in the Vietnam War got caught in the middle of these hard, hard feelings toward the administration that, that started with the Kennedy era and then carried through to uh, uh, actually, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter and, and the, the boys uh, that came later. But uh, the, the public, because of the media and because Hollywood uh, was so negative toward the war, and the, and the only way of those who dodged the draft and avoided serving in the military, the only way they could make themselves look good was by trying to make those of us who did serve in the war look bad. And the public bought it, and they invented their frustration and anger towards the troops. It was just that simple. And I was, I never felt really bitter about it. I was disappointed because most of us served just like our fathers and grandfathers did in World War One and World War Two. We wanted to serve our country. I mean, I didn't, I would have wound up there anyway, but I volunteered, and uh, which was kind of hard to swallow when I first got into basic training. I was in there with another friend of mine, and we were both volunteers, and he says, they can't treat us like that. We're, we're volunteers. <laughs> That's how they can. But, uh, well, it's, it's great. I, I think a lot, of, a lot of young men and women that are in a little town like Haines, Alaska, it's a great place to raise a family, but there's a certain number of years that you need to get out of here and see part of the world, and I think one of the best ways to do that is through the military. They're, they're paying big money now. They're paying for college educations, uh, it's a great experience. For those that, that really like the military, it, it's a great career. Okay. Um, for the camera, can you please state your name and what it has taken you to stay in Haynes? <laughs>